the doctrine of Christian liberty. What could I possibly say about the doctrine of Christian liberty? Um, it is a direct outflow from the gospel. Uh, Christian liberty is something that has been purchased for us by Christ. And if you have not heard sermons or lessons on the doctrine of Christian liberty, maybe it's time to ask your pastor about the doctrine of Christian liberty. Welcome to the Baptist Broadcast. It is great to be here. Um, you can find this podcast on any platform, uh, anchor.fm, Spotify, iTunes, and the list goes on. If you're watching here on YouTube, please do not forget to click the bell for... I always mess this up. Do not forget to click the subscribe button, first of all. Then, when the little bell pops up next to the subscribe button, do not forget to click it either. I am coming under the weather with something, and I'm I'm cloudy, and so uh, we'll see how this we'll see how this goes. It seems like every other month there's something going on here with regard to uh, a cold or you know a flu or something like that. <laughs> so it's been rough going for the last few months. So um, the doctrine of Christian liberty. I recently taught a, a Sunday school class, uh, a Lord's Day, uh, a Sabbath school. Maybe we should call it Sabbath school. Uh, a Sabbath school class on the doctrine of Christian liberty. And when I taught this particular lesson, my goal was to relate the doctrine of Christian liberty to the work of Christ on the one hand, and also to the practical outflow of the doctrine of Christian liberty within the context of the local church on the other hand. Um, often when we talk about the doctrine of Christian liberty, we don't necessarily relate it to Christ, uh, and we don't necessarily relate it to uh, the kind of practical life within the local church. And so that's what I wanted to accomplish in that class. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through uh, the same outline that I used in that class, but we're going to uh, probably take some liberty uh, to discuss some things in, in, in some more depth, maybe things I didn't have time to get to in the class. And so if you are a member or visitor of Victory Baptist Church, welcome. Uh, even if you heard this in Sunday school uh, or Sabbath school, then you will uh, hopefully still benefit by listening to this podcast because I'm going to try to expand on, on some of these things a little bit further. Um, those of you who are not part of our church, never been to our church, not associated with our church at all, welcome. You are so welcome, and I'm glad that you're here. Hopefully this doctrine uh, is is helpful to you. Um, again, it is a doctrine that, as the confession states, was purchased for us by Christ, and so that relates it to, a, to the gospel in the sense that the doctrine of Christian liberty is not just this thing we throw out there for our convenience. Uh, it's not just kind of this, this abstract concept that... Um, serves as kind of a moral catch-all for, for, for ethical gray areas. Uh, this is an actual benefit of the gospel that Jesus Christ shed his blood for. And I think if we start uh, understanding Christian liberty that way, we will start uh, understanding Christian liberty rightly, that it's a benefit of the gospel that has been purchased for us by the blood of Christ. I want to begin by... Uh, by asking the question, what is Christian liberty? Um, and then we're just going to kind of move through this outline. Uh, again, I'm going to expound on some things that I didn't get an opportunity to, to expound on in the, uh, in the class itself. When we ask the question, what is Christian liberty? Uh, I think we could safely answer, uh, first of all, that, that it has a definition. Uh, again, it's not just this kind of obscure, abstract, ill-defined moral catch-all. It, it, it refers to a specific kind of Christian liberty. And again, this liberty is, is related to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It refers to a, Christian liberty refers to a specific kind of liberty that was purchased for us by Christ. Um, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 really gets like the core of Christian liberty. What's the very substance of Christian liberty? And that is, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So we're set free from the curse of the law, uh, having become a curse for us. Uh, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So Jesus takes our place. 
uh, he takes upon himself the wrath of God. He dies a death that we could not satisfactorily die. Uh, and of course, he imputes to us his righteousness. Um, and so there's the implication of all of this is liberty, but the implication is a specified liberty. It's not just uh, whatever we want it to be. And so when we talk about Christian liberty, we're not talking about you know, a political notion like classical liberalism, or we're not even talking necessarily about the liberty that is uh, discussed in the American Constitution. This is a specified liberty that is defined in relation to the law of God. It has everything to do with us being set free from sin, death, and the devil. And it exists only for the Christian. Uh, it's something that the Christian, it's a unique benefit for the Christian. So it's it's not the natural notion of liberty like we would be used to in more political discussions. This is a uh, an article of the gospel. It's an article of faith. It comes through the gospel uh, alone. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, and so it's a unique blessing or benefit for the Christian. It results in liberty from or a freedom from 10 things and a freedom to two things. So the this whole from to, I, I broke this out in the class the other day. Uh, f- we're, we're set free from the guilt of sin, divine condemnation, rigor and curse of the law, the present evil world, bondage to Satan, dominion of sin, the evil of afflictions, fear and sting of death, the victory of the grave, and everlasting damnation. So that's 10 things from which we are freed according to the doctrine of Christian liberty. And then we're freed to... Two things, free access to God, that is, we're, we're, we're now free to approach God through Jesus Christ and, um, and to behold him, and we are free to lovingly and willfully obey him uh, and his law. Uh, and, and there are some implications. This unfolds in, in several kinds, uh, several different implications. Uh, I want to go ahead and read the Second London Confession of Faith, uh, uh, chapter 21, uh, paragraph 1. And it says, The liberty which Christ hath purchased for believers under the gospel consists in their freedom from the guilt of sin, the condemning wrath of God, the rigor and curse of the law, and in their being delivered from His pre- from this present evil world, bondage to Satan and dominion of sin, from the evil of afflictions, the fear and sting of death, the victory of the grave, and everlasting damnation. As also in their free access to God, and their yielding obedience unto him, not out of slavish fear, but a childlike love and willing mind, all which were common also to believers under the law for the substance of them. But under the New Testament, the liberty of Christians is further enlarged in their freedom from the yoke of a ceremonial law to which the Jewish church was subjected and in greater boldness of access to the throne of grace and in fuller communications of the, of the free spirit of God than believers under the law did ordinarily partake of. Okay, so that's where I get that list of, of 10 things we're freed from and two things that we're freed to. And those are each found through the scripture instead, from the scriptures. Instead, in fact, uh, a lot of the language, you know, guilt of sin, we're freed from that. Divine condemnation, we're freed from that. Romans 8. Um, rigor and curse of the law, the present evil world, uh, bondage to Satan. All of those are really just scriptural categories that are lifted directly out of the text. Uh, by the framers of the confession. Article 2 draws an implication from from Article 1 or Paragraph 1, and it says this, God alone is Lord of the conscience. Okay, so we move from the, really the substance of Christian liberty, which is to be related to the atoning work of Christ and what he has purchased for us. Um, From that, the framers move to this idea of God alone being the Lord of the conscience. Now, why is God alone the Lord of the conscience? Well, because he, number one, he's our creator, but it's actually, it's actually strengthened by considering the fact that he has actually purchased us with his own blood. So he becomes the owner uh, of us and uh, by extension, the owner of his churches. And that's going to be important when we get to, you know, the level of church life here in a moment. But God alone is Lord of the conscience and hath left it free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Why are we free from the doctrines and commandments of men? Because Christ has purchased us. Men, 
the men who would, you know, bind up heavy burdens and set them on our shoulders, they have not purchased us. They're not the rightful owners of us. There is one to whom we belong, rightfully so, because he has purchased us with his own blood. And so we are freed, therefore, from the doctrines and commandments of men, which are in anything contrary to his word. And it's not just it's not just that we're it's not just that we're free from laws and commands that are contrary to the word of God, but we're free from doctrines or commandments that are not contained in it as well. So that they move on to a further implication, so that to believe such doctrines, to believe man-made doctrines, or obey such commands, to obey man man-made commands out of conscience, out of the conviction that you ought to, is to betray true liberty of conscience. To say it another way, it's to betray that which Christ has purchased for us via his own blood. And the requiring of an implicit faith and absolute and blind obedience is to destroy liberty of conscience and reason also. So, in, in summary, uh, Christian liberty means we are free from sin, death, and the devil. If you could just summarize that list of ten things up in three terms rather than ten, you could say sin, death, the devil. And it means that we're free to come before God to behold him and to obey him rightly and lovingly. Uh, and then, so, by implication of that, because we belong to God now through Christ and he owns us in a very peculiar way, we're not subject to the doctrines and commandments of men. We're subject only to the doctrines and commandments of God as he has revealed them to us through his holy word. Um, in the class, I, I painted out three more, um, three rules for understanding Christian liberty. And I, I find that these rules, they're just propositions basically that further elaborate upon the doctrine of Christian liberty, what it is and what it isn't. I find these three rules to be extremely helpful for myself as I think through really how to, to summarize the substance and the implications of the doctrines of Christian liberty. And those three rules are this. Number one, liberty is not license. Liberty is not license. There are many who uh, are scared or they're fearful of the doctrine of Christian liberty because they have seen it used by the libertines or by licentious individuals in order to justify their sins. And so perceiving Christian liberty to just be an excuse for sin, they won't teach on it or preach on it at all. And instead, they will try to coerce Christian behavior through things like man-made laws. Uh, without a doctrine of Christian liberty, really the only alternative is to have you know, the doctrines and commandments and traditions of men uh, that go above and beyond God's law so that we can coerce behavior um, to get an end product that is more palatable to our pietistic sensibilities or moralistic sensibilities. So um, to avoid that, I just want to start off by saying liberty is not license. Now, how is liberty not license? Well, when we're talking about Christian liberty, Christian liberty does not mean we can do anything and everything we desire to do. All right. It doesn't mean we can do anything and everything we desire to do. Why? Because our desires are not expressions of Christian liberty. All right. What is an expression of Christian liberty? Well, it would be obedience to the law of liberty, to use the words that James uses, which describes the moral law of God. The ability to obey the moral law of God is a free, you know is freedom from sin. Uh, it's freedom from death and from the dominion of Satan. And so to, to, to be able to obey the law of God is, is a, a, a part or an aspect of Christian liberty. Our desires and just being able to do whatever it is we want to do doesn't describe Christian liberty at all. Why? Because the Bible teaches us that our hearts are deceitful, that they're wicked, and in fact that they're enslaved by sin. And so our desires are not healthy indicators of what liberty actually looks like. Uh, what liberty actually looks like is revealed to us in, uh, in, in God's moral law. And so often our desires are expressions of bondage to sin, not freedom, not liberty, but true liberty, Christian liberty, is the ability to obey God's moral law. If we look at some texts like 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 21, and there Paul says, for, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all 
that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law. But then Paul qualifies. He's not saying that he was an antinomian or that he played the part of an antinomian, that he played the part as a lawless person. That's not what he's saying there. He qualifies. He says, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ. That is, being a law keeper within the context of the gospel, not being a law keeper within the context of the Old Testament or the Old Covenant, that I might win those who are without law. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 22, For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. So in these texts, 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 7, there's obligation, there's duty, there is a responsibility to heed the words and obey the words of the one who has purchased us, and that is Christ. So liberty is not license. Liberty, if anything, in terms of Christian liberty, is the freedom from the bondage of the world uh, and the ability to obey Christ and heed the voice of our ch- of our shepherd. Just to pile one more text on there, Romans 6, 18, and having been set free from sin, liberty, you became slaves of righteousness, right? And so there's, there's duty there still. Um, it's not licentiousness. In fact, we're turned to righteousness uh, and, not, uh, and, and not the bondage of licentiousness. So liberty is not license. License would be bondage to sin. Liberty is an expression of the opposite. Liberty is an expression of having been set free from sin, death, and the devil. So that's rule number one. Liberty is not license. Rule number two, liberty, Christian liberty, respects individual conscience. Liberty respects individual conscience. Individual consciences are free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Okay? Individual consciences are free from the doctrines of and commandments of men. Neither a man nor the whole church is Lord of a man's conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience. That's the language of the Second London Confession. Now, let me qualify with this. Uh, There's been a fair deal of discourse on my channel uh, and uh, on my blog and so on about creeds and confessions. I, I am a firm uh, subscriber to Orthodox creeds and the Second London Confession. Um, when we when we uh, advocate for the use of creeds and confessions, we're not adv- We need to be clear that we're not advocating for doctrines and commandments of men. We need to be clear that when we advocate for creeds and confessions of the faith, we're advocating for those documents because we believe they are correctly and accurately derived from Scripture. In other words, they're, they're nothing aside from Scripture or in addition to Scripture. They just are Scripture summarized, all right? So if they are correct, they're just repeating Scripture to us. It's like if a preacher from the pulpit preaches truth, even if he doesn't use the exact words out of Scripture, his words are as authoritative as Scripture if they are, in fact, scriptural. And so if creeds and confessions are scriptural, then it's just Scripture summarized. Um, And so in that sense, they are authoritative. They're not authoritative simply because they are historical. They're not authoritative simply because uh, our favorite theologian had a hand in drafting them. They are authoritative because they are essentially guarding the scriptures. They are promoting the scriptures, and they are correctly articulating the meaning and the sense of scripture. Okay, so uh, liberty respects individual conscience. Uh, When I say liberty respects individual conscience, we need to see that in light of liberty is not license. So how do we understand individual conscience? Can it just be formed and informed by anything and everything we want it to be formed and informed by? And the answer is no. It needs to be formed and informed by the Word of God. It needs to be formed and informed by goodness, truth, and beauty, Um, and, and not just anything or any source we would we would so choose. And uh, that would include, of course, creeds and confessions as they are seen to be scriptural and uh, adopted as uh, documents that are um, 
accurate summaries of the truth, then they are just representing scriptural data. They're just representing scriptural truth in summary form so that we can represent to others and keep ourselves accountable to what we confess. Okay, so um, individual consciences are free from the doctrines and commandments of men. Neither a man nor the whole church is Lord of a man's conscience. God alone is Lord of the conscience. Look back at, at 1 Corinthians 7.23. 1 Corinthians 7.23 says, You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. One of the reasons true Christian liberty must respect the individual conscience of a man is because men are not ultimately responsible to obey you or to obey their pastor or even to obey their elders. They're chiefly responsible to obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And so... uh, a, a healthy doctrine of liberty respects individual conscience, and that means that individual consciences are not bound by the doctrines and commandments of men. God alone is Lord of the conscience. And then you have Paul's imperative, do not become slaves of men. Why shouldn't we become slaves of men? Well, because we were bought at a price. Bought by who? Jesus Christ our Lord. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Um, Notice there, he's not saying don't do philosophy at all. You know, we need to throw all that stuff away. We need to throw all tradition away. He's saying tradition and philosophy that is not according to Christ, right? That is not consistent with Christ, that is not according to Christ, that is not supportive of the doctrines that Christ has given us as a church. We can't be held captive by those things. Isaiah chapter 29, verses 13 through 14, I think is a very clear text that that necessitates a doctrine of Christian liberty. Again, that's Isaiah 29, verses 13 through 14. These people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. Now notice here that the external instances of obedience are there. They are externally crying out to the Lord. They are externally, they're praying. They look pious. They externally honor God. That's what God says. They honor me with their lips. But internally, they are far from God. So they're doing all the, it appears as if they're doing all of the outward practices. And perhaps that's what they think Christianity is, or that's what they think uh, Judaism is in the case of Isaiah 29, uh, Old Testament, we could say Old Testament, that's what they think Old Testament Christianity is. Um, but that's not what it is. Um, God is, God is out for hearts, uh, not just external deeds. And so he, he's chiding the people, these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. And they and now listen to this, their fear toward me w- is taught, instructed, informed by the commandment of men. So uh, their piety is informed by the traditions or the commandments of men. All right. And, And God is chiding the people for that. Therefore, he says, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among the people, a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Romans 14, 1, receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. And then a whole chapter, well, half a chapter follows on the doctrine of Christian liberty. Romans 14 is so incredibly helpful. Uh, again, this this stuff is all throughout scripture. Paul's dealing in Romans 14, by the way, he's dealing with, you know, these little quibbles that people would get into concerning, you know, should we eat this or that meat? Or can we eat this or that uh, kind of food? Uh, or, you know, can we... Um, uh, observe this day or that day? Is that is that lawful for us? And there would be huge disputes that are, would, would arise out of these things. And Paul's saying, look, it actually doesn't matter um, because, you know, none of these things are explicitly forbidden or commanded by God. And so, uh, you know, the, the, the one who eats, let him eat and, and, and not be, you know, chastised by the one who chooses not to eat. And the one who chooses not to eat, let him not be chastised uh, by the one who uh, chooses to eat. And you can drop this principle into any circumstance. For example, drinking, you know, enjoying a drink like wine or something like that. Um, 
the one who drinks, let him not chide the one who does not. The one who does not, let him not chide the one who does. You know, there's all sorts of controversies about whether or not Christians should, should celebrate Christmas. And I don't think churches should, but I think it's according to individual conscience if they want to do something at home, um, as long as they do it unto the Lord. And the idea here is, you know, don't don't um, don't bind the conscience either way. That's that's the whole sum and substance of the first half of Romans 14. Very important, extremely important, because it's it's basically getting into the internal mechanics of a benefit of the gospel that Jesus Christ purchased for us via his own blood. Liberty must respect individual conscience. Okay, that's the second rule. The third rule is liberty of individual Christians is or must be upheld by the church. Churches need to defend this doctrine and uphold this doctrine uh, because churches are tasked with teaching and proclaiming and upholding uh, that which Christ has purchased for us in the gospel. Liberty is what Christ purchased for believers. And, uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, there is the tendency of uh, the legalist to and even legalistic pastors uh, and legalistic churches to, to steal the liberty of the individual rather than uphold the liberty of the individual, trusting in the Holy Spirit of God to do a work in them through the ordinary means of grace. So, and, and when that happens, what Christ purchased for us, liberty, is obscured at best and stolen at worst. Um, and so when, when churches or church leadership decides to obscure or encroach upon Christian liberty in virtue of imposing their own, what they think is best, you know, making kind of their, what they perceive to be their wisdom, uh, imposing that as commandments and laws upon the people, what they're doing is they're obscuring the doctrine of Christian liberty and they're obscuring what Christ has purchased for his people. Now, I, I don't think anyone who falls into most men who fall into that error do so connivingly or, uh, or, or, or it's not as if they've schemed to steal benefits away from Christ's people. Uh, but there's a, a serious misunderstanding about the work of the Holy Spirit in God's people through the ordinary means of grace, like the preaching of the word and the fellowship of the saints, that God actually does a work in his people. And there's a faithlessness that says, well, if I want this people to be as disciplined as possible, or if we want these people to be Christian, we need to add this or that standard. And we can't do that. We're not allowed to. We're not the kings. Jesus Christ is the king. And he tells us what uh, is is commanded for his churches. Uh, Paul instructs churches in Romans 14. Uh, I'm going to read a little bit more of Romans 14 than I did earlier. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things. So, you know, he's free from the bondage of the ceremony or the yoke of the ceremonial law. But he who is weak eats only vegetables. You know, he's got a very sensitive conscience about eating anything related to meat. So he eats only vegetables. And then Paul says, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, let him who eats... Let not him who eats despise him who, who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Okay. The idea there is, you know, uh, to each his own in this respect. You know, this guy can eat vegetables if he wants. He doesn't have to eat meat. Uh, I might, you know, as a brother, poke fun at him for, <laughs> for, not, for not enjoying meat. Um. But, uh, but I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't be permitted to approach him and say, you know, I think it's more healthy for you to eat meat. You must eat meat as your pastor. You, you need to, you need to get some steak in that diet. And then likewise, he can't come to me and say, you know, well, you can't be eating pork, uh, cause pork's just really unhealthy. And I don't think it, it, it should be lawful for you to eat pork. You really need to not do that. Um, you know, Paul's saying, no, uh, one believes he can eat all things. The other one believes he can only eat vegetables, and that's that's fine. Don't bother each other over it, you know. Uh, Romans 14, 12 through 13, kind of skipping ahead two verses. One person esteems one day above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to, the, to he who, uh, let's see, and he who does not observe the day 
to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. Hold on a minute here. I'm going to do something. Getting into some technology here. It's very difficult for me. Okay, so, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. Okay, so the idea here is it's fine. It's fine to have those differences. He goes on, for if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. There's that language again. We, we belong to the Lord. You don't, you don't belong to the man who thinks he shouldn't eat pork. So he's going to, you know, enforce that as a commandment in the church or something. You don't belong to him. You have no obligation to him. You belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the place of a shepherd or the place of a pastor is to is to reinforce what Christ has already taught through teaching and preaching and through persuasion in hopes that the Holy Spirit will convict consciences and so on. And of course, when it comes to outright sin, there is uh, church discipline, um, specific church discipline, uh, but, but church discipline is not enacted because a doctrine or a commandment of man's making was violated. Church discipline is enacted when someone has shown themselves uh, or is in perhaps process of showing themselves to maybe not be a believer because they're in perpetual and unrepentant disobedience to God's law. Okay. And so it's God's, God's word still stands as the standard for church discipline. We can't just enact church discipline for any reason at all. It must be in light of God's law. Um, But why do you judge your brother, Paul goes on, or why do you show contempt for your brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ owns us. He's the one who gets to to judge. Uh, He's the one who gets to set the standard. We, 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 we don't. Um, Dr. Jim Renahan says this. He says this in his... um, volume uh, to the judicious and impartial reader, the recent uh, book uh, that is a commentary essentially on the Second London Confession. Very helpful. And he says, liberty of conscience is destroyed by believing human doctrines or obeying human commands out of conscience, a phrase intended to condemn submission to any doctrine or command not stated or contained in Scripture. To do so is to betray the benefits purchased by Christ. The reason for this destruction is that by following human doctrines or commands, we have dethroned God and placed another authority in his stead. So when you see the doctrine of Christian liberty related to the lordship of Christ and the atoning work of Christ, the fact that Christ has purchased us with his own blood, therefore we're responsible to to him and him alone— Uh, That brings Christian liberty into a whole new light. We're no longer bound to men because we don't belong to men. We belong to a man, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and must live as if that's true. Um, I have more to say about, we're at 33 minutes, I have a lot more to say about the doctrine of Christian liberty. Let's, Let's think about As we've laid out the doctrine of Christian liberty, let's think about the doctrine of Christian liberty within the church. Everyone has, well, maybe not everyone, but a lot lot of people that I've interacted with and I myself have had run-ins with um, people within the church who have made attempts to enforce their own wisdom as commands uh, or perhaps or perhaps they've made uh, attempts to enforce their own cultural excuse me their own cultural traditions uh, maybe their own church culture they've they've made attempts to enforce that as requirement for church membership, um, and, and it's required to live life with, with this or that particular church. We've all run into scenarios like this. Um, the most extreme examples of this is found in like the cults. 
But this happens even within, uh, you know, various circles uh, found within evangelicalism and uh, fundamentalism in particular, where a man or a group of men uh, believe that they know best for the congregation and rather than relying on the revelation that God has delivered to us uh, and and actually teaching and preaching that revelation in hopes that the Spirit convicts in the direction of God's standard, uh, they have thought it best to enforce their own commandments so that they can maintain a kind of culture. Okay. This happens all over the United States in particular, uh, where there are there are churches that enforce extra biblical commandments um, and they're codified, you know, in the church, you know, documentation and so on. What happens in those cases? And we could ask all sorts of questions, you know, isn't it, isn't it the liberty of the church to live life like they want to live life? You know, and so why not? Why can't they add their own, you know, idioms, um, their own idiosyncrasies into their their constitutions and their statements of faith and their covenants? Why it, it, is the local church at liberty to do that so long as they're not, you know, registering anything contrary to the law of God? Uh, if it's something in addition to the law of God, if it's something above and beyond the law of God, then can't they do that? Aren't they at liberty to do that? And the answer would be no. And the reason the answer would be no is that churches, unlike individuals, churches are governed entities. All right. That is to say, they're entities that include government. And that's the whole doctrine of church polity. How is your church governed? And that automatically uh, brings to mind. Um, connotations like authority uh, or rule. Um, and the church, as a governed entity, has a measure of authority. Now that authority is derivative, it's to be derivative from Christ and his word, but nevertheless it has an authority that obligates the consciences of its members. This is why it's so important for the church constitution, the church covenant, the church statement of faith to be biblical, to be derivative of scripture. Because if it's not deriv derivative of scripture, and if it just includes, you know, man-made commandments or something like that, then what's actually going on there is the enforcement, there's an, uh, there's a, uh, an, uh, an authority behind it, an enforcement of regulations, commandments, or traditions that are inceived by men. And that's a real problem in light of what we've talked about. It's a problem in light of what we've talked about because, again, Christ purchased the church. Not the deacon board, not the elders, not the pastor. Christ purchased the church. And so it's Christ's word that gets to be the governing standard for the church. So let's talk about liberty and the church a little bit here. And we'll kind of do stop and go as I go through the outline um, because there's there's some important items here. Um, when it comes to churches, uh, we're no longer speaking about individuals or citizens of the kingdom. We're, we're talking about governed entities. I went through all that already. Um, and we're talking about governed, in, governed entities that are obligated by Scripture to uphold and defend the doctrine of Christian liberty as it's already been stated and defined. Romans 14, elsewhere. And since it's a governed, in, governed entity that's obligated by Christ to uphold that doctrine, it is forbidden from imposing anything via their church covenant, statement of faith, or uh, their church constitution that is not revealed in Holy Scripture. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this. The, the, the churches are bound to respect and uphold the liberty that Christ has purchased for his people. Why? First... Because each individual Christian is freed to Christ to serve him, to obey him, to be slaves of his righteousness. And so if a church decides to impose additional commandments upon its members that are not scriptural, 
it imposes upon true liberty of the individual conscience. No longer is the individual free to obey God and God alone. No longer is the church kind of this vehicle of delivering the oracles of God to the people. The church is now in the business of delivering the oracles of man to the people, and the people are made to feel as if they have to obey those man-made oracles. Um, true liberty of individual conscience, which is a blessing, again, a, a benefit purchased by Christ, is taken away from a congregation that follows the doctrines and commandments of men. And that's a serious error. And let me qualify with this, brothers and sisters. This goes for people who voluntarily ascend to obey those man-made commandments. All right? And the reason it, it goes for people who voluntarily ascend to obey those man-made commandments and traditions is because they're, they, they do not have liberty to cut themselves off from what Christ has purchased for them. All right. Liberty ends where scriptural revelation and biblical authority begins. All right. So if Christ has purchased, for example, if Christ has purchased the benefit of participation in the Lord's Supper for you, and you just arbitrarily, it's no, no church discipline or anything, and you just arbitrarily decide to cut yourself off from the Lord's table, you can't do that. Actually, there's no lawful, you can't lawfully do that. Um, there's no provision for that in the scriptures. Um, the let's let's go with church attendance. Uh, the participation in the congregation week in and week out on the Sabbath is a profound benefit purchased for us by Christ. We don't have the liberty to just say, "Well, I don't want that benefit." You know, I want to cut myself off from that. Likewise, Christian liberty is a benefit purchased by Christ. We can't just say to ourselves, "Like, oh, I want to I want to cut myself off from that benefit of the gospel." Um, no, if you if, if if the whole Christ died for you, you get the whole Christ, and that entails all the blessings and benefits that come with that, right? That are packaged therein. So it's not just a sin on the side that imposes the man-made commandments, it's a sin on the side that ascends to man-made commandments. Both are responsible at that point. Um, secondly, if a local, and, the, and I'm, these are two reasons, again, just to remind you, these are two reasons the church is bound to respect and uphold Christian liberty. The first reason is because the each individual Christian is freed to Christ to serve him and him alone, and that precludes, you know, service toward, you know, uh, obedience to man-made man commandments and so on. The second reason is if a local church is a governed entity, who is, who is it who ultimately governs it? Who governs the church? Now, if, if your first thought was, I need to stop kicking my camera stand. If your first thought was to say, the pastor, <laughs> let's walk back a little bit and let's talk about who actually bought the church with his own blood. And we can do that by looking at, um, we can do that by looking at Ephesians 5. And if you go over to Ephesians 5, we see Ephesians 5, 20, beginning of uh, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Okay. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and blame and, and without blemish. Um, and... The idea here is that it's Christ who purchased the church, and he purchased the church for a particular reason, and Christian liberty actually fits into the reasoning um, as, as a benefit that we enjoy throughout the course of our sanctification, and a benefit that expresses the profound reality of Christ having purchased us. Um, and so, all that to say, Jesus governs the church. Uh, the pastor is just a witness uh, to the authority of Christ as he preaches and exposits the word of God by the grace of God. He's just witnessing to this other authority, not his authority, but to the authority of Jesus Christ. And so the pastor's authority, any that he has, is derived from Christ and what Christ has already said in his holy word. So Jesus governs the church. 
And if it's governed by Jesus, then its laws, its ordinances, and anything else we could list there come from him and no one else. Um, let me, let's walk through this example. Again, this is, much of this is what I've already gone through in the class at, at our church. Imagine for a moment that you live in a land and this land is governed by a king. And this king decides to put you in charge of one of the cities in his nation, in his kingdom. And so he's put you in charge of one of his cities in his kingdom. And he says, he says to you, you are my representative and it's your duty, it's your job to administrate this city according to my instructions. That's what the king says to you. It's your duty to administrate the affairs of this city according to the instructions that I give to you. All right, that's the duty. But once you arrive to the city and you take your seat as the king's regent in that city, imagine that you're not satisfied with the king's instructions. Maybe you think they're insufficient. Um, maybe things aren't going as well as you thought they they should go. So you decide to uh, add some more laws, add some more instructions, instructions coming from your own wisdom and the way you think things ought to be done. So you add, you add four or five additional laws. When the king finds out, what's he going to do? Well, he, he's going to arrest you. He's going to send a, a, you know, a uh, convoy out to your city uh, to arrest you and then convoy you back to the capital, wherever it is he is. He's going to bring you in for a trial. And, uh, and so he is going to then charge you at that trial. And what's he going to charge? What's he going to charge you for? What's he going to charge you for? He's going to charge you for usurpation, for usurping his authority. All right. He's going to charge you for usurping his authority. And do you know what usurpation is? Usurpation is a form of treason. All right. It's a form of treason. It is, it's a form of betraying one's own nation. Uh, because this person uh, who, who took this post of responsibility in one of the king's cities took it upon himself to grant himself authority over that city, even though he was just supposed to be a representative of the king. The messenger of the king essentially added more message than the king gave to him. So he's going to be charged with usurpation. More broadly, he's going to be charged with treason. Christ is our king. He's our king. He's also our prophet. He's our priest, but he's our king. And pastors are Christ's representatives. All right. Uh, churches are his cities on earth. If we can think of them that way, pastors are to be faithful representatives of the king. And the moment pastors begin to treat our king's cities like their own, they say, well, I'll just add a, a law here or a rule here. They commit treason. The church is Christ's city. It's the city of God. It's governed by his laws. And we're in sin when we add to it. So, I, you know, hopefully considering Christian liberty in light of the atoning work of Christ on the one hand, and then within the context of the local church on the other hand, the gravity of this doctrine uh, somewhat strikes you. Um, it is an extremely important doctrine. Again, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, it has been abused, and because it has been abused, it has been nearly rejected by a whole swath of especially, you know, more fundamentalist Christianity that has taken to a strategy of more or less adding their own commandments and laws and traditions to uh, the responsibilities of the church. And what, what has ended up happening as a result is, you know, uh, you have this whole issue of, you know, churches, churches will, this will kill churches eventually. It'll kill souls. It'll kill souls because the man-made commandments are usually the ones that come to be emphasized the most. And whenever man-made commandments are emphasized the most, that is Christianity, especially to younger professing Christians in that congregation. That's their perception of, when, of what Christianity is. And so when those things are challenged or when those things, uh, when they begin to see through those things, the, the veneer of legalism, so to speak, 
they're going to do one of one of two things. They're going to flee that church for greener pastures. And when I say greener pastures, I mean solid churches. Or they're going to leave Christianity altogether because to them that's what Christianity is. And if they see that that's false, then they're going to they're going to impute that falsehood to all of Christianity. They're going to say I'm done with it and then they're going to leave. It's happened time and time again, and it still happens uh, to this day. So, all that to say, we must hold high the doctrine of Christian liberty. Churches must defend it tooth and nail. It is a hill worth dying on. It's a hill worth dying on. It is a very important doctrine. And I only say it's a hill worth dying on because it's something that Christ Jesus has purchased with his own blood. That's very important for us to consider as Christians. Hopefully this has been helpful. We're a little uh, long today. Uh, that's okay. Uh, but uh, if it was helpful, please share it. Um, again, if you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. Click the bell for continued notifications. And we will look forward to seeing you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day.